We had another project uh, in which we uh, aim at uh, building a database on, on immigration uh, policy. So you can see that there's a, a big new trend uh, in the immigration literature. We build all these indices. And um, uh, Hein told us uh, two, days, uh, yeah, two days ago that uh, and I made a similar experience when I started to write up uh, the proposal for that grant that I thought that I was the very first one who thought about this. Um, and was quite puzzled by the fact that nobody else actually started to build indices, um, only to find out once I got the grant that actually there are already a lot of people actually <laughs> who, and this does not even include the most recent projects like the DEMIC and other projects, to find out that actually there are a lot of people who already built uh, policy indices in some way or another. Um, and so the first thing uh, I had to do uh, together with my colleagues is actually to get an overview of all these indices to find out well that there's still something to do in that field or we should rather start another project. Um, so what we did here in this forthcoming article in IMR, uh, we look at the empirical scope of these indices, how they have conceptualized indices, or the database, how they measured and aggregated it. And the good news was actually that there are still a lot of gaps and limitations in all these projects, so we thought that it's still worthwhile uh, to continue this project and uh, to collect um, uh, this data. So first of all, the uh, when it comes to the empirical scope, uh, most of these existing indices are focused on very specific aspects, like labor migration asylum, because uh, these indices have been built uh, to answer actually specific research questions uh, uh, because these people were coming from these uh, different fields. Often there's a trade-off between time and, and, and uh, uh, country coverage, so some cover more countries, but only individual years or the other way around. And even more important for us was uh, we're actually quite puzzled by the fact that uh, hardly anybody really defines immigration policy. And uh, first you might think, well, it's pretty clear what immigration policy is about, but when you start thinking about it, and we will see this in a minute, actually there are a, little, a lot of different aspects, uh, different dimensions and subfields that should or could be relevant. So uh, we, we thought that it's actually quite important to invest some time in, in the definition of immigration policies and the differentiation between different dimensions of immigration policy. And also, um, a problem was that often it was not so clear how, how actually people measured uh, these, uh, these different items and indices, partly because data is not, not often not accessible. There are very, there's very little methodological discussion on how to measure, how to select items, uh, etc. And another part for at least, and that's maybe the main difference between the DIMIC uh, uh, database and our database, is that some of these indices, not all, uh, they are more interested in changes of policies, not, not in the absolute values, which makes it possible actually impossible to compare countries in specific years, for example. Um, so empirical scope briefly in this project, so we try to uh, come up with a, uh, a, a quite large encompassing uh, definition um, or approach uh, to include all different dimensions and fields of immigration policy for the period uh, 1980 to 2010 and in all OCD countries. So conceptualization of this impact um, a database or index or indices actually. So first of all, we differentiate between policy dimensions and uh, policy fields. And when it comes to the policy fields, we differentiate first of all between uh, four different fields, labor migration, asylum, family reunification, and co -etnics. And we came up with this typology because we think that those four fields, and we make uh, further differentiations within the fields where we differentiate between high and low skilled, for example, or different kind of family reunification uh, aspects. But the, the, the rationale be behind this uh, differ differentiation here is that it uh, should reflect the main reasons why a state might accept immigrants. So a state might accept it for economic reasons, uh, the labor migration, uh, for humanitarian reasons, asylum, for social reasons when it comes to family reunification, but also for cultural or historical reasons when it comes to Konix, because there are people that uh, um, can be into account for historical and, and, and cultural reasons because they speak the same language, there's some historical ties with another country and for that enjoy different uh, or encounter different rules than, than other migrants. And when it comes to the policy dimensions, first of all, we differentiate between regulations and control uh, mechanisms. So the differentiation here is that regulation is basically the, the, the rights and duties of immigrants and, the, and, and then, but then there are also a lot of rules that actually control whether uh, these uh, laws actually um, are respected. To give you an example, when it comes to labor migration, for example, there might be specific conditions laid out under, this, under which circumstances somebody can uh, work in a country, and, uh, but then this also needs to be controlled through, for example, worksite uh, controls, um, whether actually people are, uh, illegal people are employed or not. So this aspect is also quite important to find out whether uh, a state is respective or not. Uh, because you might have a lot of, of, of rules under which circumstances somebody might work, but if nobody controls this, then basically the, the rule is not uh, relevant anymore, or not that relevant. 
Second uh, differentiation, be, uh, we make a differentiation between external and internal. First you will say, well, uh, admission policies, that's basically about the border crossing and, and what happens at the border. But uh, we think that also what, once a migrant uh, um, entered a country, all these aspects also become important because this might make a country more attractive and more or less liberal. And um, um, So for example, to give another example about control mechanisms, some, uh, an external control mechanism would be, for example, air carrier. Um, um, uh, uh, laws that, for example, force airlines to control uh, visas or to, the, to, the, what, to, to what extent actually people are allowed to enter a country, whereas the worksite control that I mentioned before would be an internal control mechanism. And then among the regulations and the external and internal regulations, we differentiate further between eligibility aspects, conditions, security of status. So how long can people actually stay? Is it possible to renew uh, permits? and also rights, what rights do they get, do they get the right to work, um, et cetera. And all these aspects are also important because again, uh, it might be that uh, state is restricted from, on one dimension when it comes to the conditions, but more generous when it comes to the uh, rights uh, people get or the other way around. So, and then basically what we did is for each of these boxes, uh, we came up with a list, uh, we had to find a list of items that actually measure all these uh, different aspects. And this allows us in the end actually then, uh, when it comes to the analytical aspects, to differentiate between all these um, different dimensions and, uh, and, and, and policy fields. So uh, I will be brief on that. Um, it's, it's not that easy sometimes to come up with all the relevant uh, items that would be relevant in, in a certain box. So we did extensive literature research, especially among the case, uh, all the case studies that exist, the qualitative literature that discusses different aspects. Uh, and, and also it was quite uh, crucial to collaborate with field experts or people who uh, specialized in silent policy, for example, or labor migration, to, to make sure that we all be, um, included all the relevant aspects. And, but we also collaborate extensively with uh, country, so-called country experts. So for each OECD country, we had a legal, most in, the, in most cases, a legal expert um, who, who helped us you know, make sure that all the aspects we actually want to measure are so relevant in that specific country. Um, and here was actually in, extremely important to uh, collaborate with legal scores because obviously we were measuring legal text and sociologists and political scientists have uh, 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 sometimes have a quite a primitive view on what a law actually is. So we came up, uh, I won't go through this, so for each box basically we came up with a list of aspects that we then uh, measured. Um, and also, I will be brief on that, uh, a lot of studies so far they have relied on expert surveys or they used secondary literature and as we all know there are certain problems with that because um, we do not really always know what experts have in mind when they uh, when they are asked how restrictive or liberal a certain measure is, uh, the same holds sometimes for certain reports. So we really uh, based our, uh, all our analysis and the coding on the legal binding regulations on the specific laws that also brings about a certain problems, um, uh, practical problems, because obviously no research team in the world speaks all the languages of all OECD countries, the different legal traditions, sometimes it's difficult to access uh, a legal text, especially in the past. So um, as I said before, we, for, for each country we collaborated with a country expert uh, who helped us actually uh, collect the data and code the data. And this uh, has been done uh, through an on online uh, tool that was accessible by all these experts in all these countries at any time so that we had, didn't have to send around uh, emails or Excel files that could actually collect directly uh, the data online um, through that uh, tool. Now, um, as I said, mentioned before, well, it should say scoring, um, important difference maybe between the Demig and our uh, project is that um, we did not ch uh, code uh, changes, but actually the absolute values um, uh, for, for each item. So, and we standardized them, so each item basically varies between zero and one, so that they are comparable. And we also uh, tried to come up with a maximum and a, with a theoretical maximum and minimum. So we did not just look at the, we also looked at the existing variation of all the specific regulations, but um, we also wanted to make sure that there's some kind of a theoretical maximum and minimum for each item, which allows, would allow us then in the next step, um, if you are still you know, interested in, in these issues or have the time and the resources, to expand uh, the, the, the sample of our data set to other countries or the time periods where certain regulations might have become even more respective or liberal than nowadays. So we should not just take the empirical maximum and minimum um, because this one then, I mean, this would just allow us to, to uh, analyze the, that specific data set, but not expand it uh, to other, extend it to other uh, countries. So just to give you an example here, that's the question, you know, what is the minimum age for sponsored spouses in order to be uh, admitted to the country? So that's one item of the family unification uh, field. 
Uh, so um, basically, I mean, the, the, so one is uh, most restrictive and uh, zero is most uh, most liberal. So most liberal is basically if, if there's no uh, there's no requirement at all. So you can bring uh, um, your spouse uh, irrespective of, of his or her age. And, and the maximum would be if this, if, I mean, that's, as I said, just a theoretical maximum, this, this doesn't exist right now, but if, if there's absolutely no way to bring uh, spouses in, this would be the theoretical maximum. And then in between, uh, we try to come up with a cat categorization of all the existing regulations of different ages. Of course, there's some, a lot of subjectivity involved in that because you, know, you could do the, um, the category, categorization a little bit different, but somehow you have to come up with a categorization that respects the also the empirical regulation. And this has, uh, allows us uh, then to compare specific regulation in a specific year with another year or with another country to make sure to actually come up and uh, find out which uh, country is more or less restricted with regard, for example, that specific aspect or other aspects that we then aggregate. Now, um, we just finished the data collection. Uh, we started with some analysis. Um, there's some, we still have to deal with some data cleaning issues. So I will show you some graphs, some analysis we did, but this is actually just to show you the potential of, of that data set, what, what you can do. So don't look at exact figures because they will certainly change. In the, in the future, once we have really finished and, and cleaned the data set. So um, one important uh, um, uh, aspect, is, is one important thing you can do with the data set is, is uh, uh, simply compare uh, countries across, for example, in a specific year. So that's, um, that's uh, family policy reunification in 2010. So you can easily you know, uh, see uh, uh, which countries are more restrictive and which countries are more uh, um, generous because you have the absolute values. That's aggregated at the, high, the highest level for including all the items then. Now, at the, at the same time, you can you know, analyze across time and fields and also disaggregate. As, as I said before, the important aspect of this data set is to have different dimensions of policies to find out. And this was, was also an issue uh, mentioned before by Katarina, that sometimes you know, certain aspects at the aggregate level might, might be quite uh, restrictive. But if you disaggregate, you find out that certain aspects become more restrictive and others become more liberal. So what you see here is, uh, again, family reunification policies in, in these four countries, Austria, Belgium, Germany, and, and Denmark. But this is, I mean, it's just a random example, basically. And above you see the external uh, regulations, and uh, below you see the internal uh, regulations uh, of family reunification policies. What you basically see in these four countries that is, uh, uh, over time, um, the external regulations become more restrictive, whereas the internal uh, regulations become more generous. So it would be, uh, you know, a short comment to just look at the, uh, at the aggregate data, and this gives you actually a more, uh, more detailed picture of what is going on, and then you could differentiate even further uh, uh, along the other dimensions I laid out before. Now, uh, of course, another aspect is then, um, uh, yeah, still a few minutes. Um, you know, what is the impact of these policies on immigration rates? And I think that's that's the main question we all ask uh, when we started these projects. Do policies actually make a difference? Have they an impact on uh, immigration uh, rates? So what I did uh, quite briefly, I basically just took off the shelf an existing data set that I started by Maida, but also continued by Giovanni Perry and colleagues. Um, they put together a data set with the bilateral uh, migration flows between uh, 15 destination countries and, and all the origin countries, uh, and include all, all kind of uh, important uh, control variables. So I just you know, merged it with our data set, but as I said, just for 15 countries uh, to see Again, you know, do policies make a difference, and uh, is it in, how important is it to make differentiation between uh, these different policies? So what I, what I did here is just to include the different indices on family reunification, labor migration, and asylum policy, and I differentiate it between external and internal um, uh, uh, um, um, regulations. And this is just a summary of what you see, uh, uh, what you see before. And again, this is just to show you the potential of the data, and maybe uh, the exact uh, findings are not so relevant at the moment because we all obviously still have to come up with some but the point here is actually to show that certain aspects are matter and other aspects don't matter in this specific point. You see, finally, if you take it, if you become, if the peace regulations become more respected, uh, um, uh, migration inflows uh, um, decrease. And this is even, uh, even a very strong for the internal aspects. When it comes to labor aspects, external regulations don't seem to play a role. Again, this is just for 15 countries, and we will add the other ones, maybe we can get a different picture. But this is just, and we see for some asylum regulations, that specific aspect don't play a role. Um, um, and this shows us how important it is, it is to disaggregate the immigration policies and to find out which specific aspects actually make a difference. Uh, in the 